Good day. My name is Jan Lee. It is my pleasure on behalf of my colleague, Professor Golda Holtzman, and the Departments of Computer Science and Statistics at Virginia Tech to welcome you to view a series of interviews with Jack Good and Donald Mickey, conducted by David Kahn and Karen Frankel. Professor Good was born in London, England in 1916 and was educated at Jesus College, Cambridge, under the supervision of G. H. Hardy. During World War II, he was seconded to the Government Code and Cipher School at Bletchley Park, where he worked as a statistician with Alan Turing, Hugh Alexander, and Max Newman in the highly successful efforts to break the German high command codes known as Enigma and Fish. Donald Mickey, born in 1923 in Rangoon, Burma, was also located at Bletchley Park working on the naval codes. Educated at rugby school and post-war at Balliol College, Oxford, Dr. Mickey specialized in linguistic techniques to break codes with Max Newman. Together, Drs. Good and Mickey enhanced the mechanical methods of code breaking, initially using a series of machines with the unfortunate name of BOM, and later with a sequence of machines named the Robinsons. With Newman and Turing, they conceived of the construction and usage of high-speed electronic devices, which ideas were implemented as the Colossus machines. These machines were operational by D-Day 1944 and significantly contributed to the finalization of the war in Europe. Since World War II, Drs. Good and Mickey have developed their talents in slightly different tracks. Dr. Good, after working at the University of Manchester during the development of the first stored program machine, became a preeminent scholar in Bayesian statistics and is one of only eight honorary members of the International Statistics Institute. He has served as a University Distinguished Professor of Statistics at Virginia Tech since 1967 and holds adjunct positions in philosophy and the Center for the Study of Science in Society. Dr. Good recently appeared on the BBC television program The Strange Life and Death of Dr. Turing. Donald Mickey completed his studies in human anatomy and physiology and earned a doctorate in mammalian genetics in 1953. Later, he returned to the study of the interrelationships between human intelligence and computers, founded the Center for Machine Intelligence at the University of Edinburgh, and later founded the Turing Institute in Glasgow, Scotland. Dr. Mickey is perhaps best known for his far-sighted work in artificial intelligence and for his being on the losing side of a bet with David Levy, the chess master, on the date by which a computer program would beat a world master at the game. Dr. Mickey's work with Alan Turing and his early efforts in artificial intelligence were recently highlighted in the joint BBC-PBS television series entitled The Machine That Changed the World. David Kahn is an editor for Newsday, specializing in the op-ed page which faces the editorial page. He is a world-renowned expert on code breaking and has published several key books on the topic. His latest book, Seizing the Enigma, appeared in the top 10 list of the New York Times ratings for nonfiction for several weeks in 1991. Dr. Kahn is also an editor of the specialized journal Cryptologia. Karen Frankel is a senior editor with the Association for Computer Machinery and has conducted a number of interviews with recipients of the Turing Award, the highest award for technical merit in computing, generally regarded as the Nobel Prize of the computing field. Karen is one of a very small number of writers who has co-authored a book with the late Isaac Asimov. Their joint effort was entitled Robots, Machines in Man's Image. Funding for this program was provided by the Departments of Computer Science and Statistics at Virginia Tech, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the Division of Research and Graduate Studies. Additional funding for travel was provided by the National Science Foundation and the Virginia Academy of Sciences. Dr. Mickey's visit to the United States was funded by the Garving Visiting Professorship of the College of Arts and Sciences at Virginia Tech. The event views took place in the TV studios of Virginia Tech on 13th of April, 1992.
Dr. Good, I thought that we might start with a little background as to your early years. Perhaps you could tell us how you became interested in what would become computer science. Uh, probably mainly during World War II, I should think, when I got used to certain kinds of computers. I'm not sure whether I read much science fiction before the war to get me interested in such matters. How did you land at um, Bletchley Park? Well, the, uh, I was um, reserved, they say. That is to say, they didn't seem to want to call me up into the army. I wasn't the right type. I wasn't an officer and a gentleman or something. And a few of us doing research were put on the so-called reserve list until jobs were found for us. It took more than a year before they did interview me for a, a job in the civil service, namely at Bletchley. And uh, I remember the interview, for example. What sorts of things did they ask you in the interview? I don't think they needed to ask anything in particular because they'd already done a, a security vetting. Mm -hmm. So they knew rather a lot about me in advance. Alexander was one of the interviewers. He was the British chess champion three times, a very intelligent guy. And uh, I had known him in the chess world. Mm -hmm. So we were to some extent, I suppose, friends. We were, didn't know each other very well yet at that time. But at least he knew that I was a fairly strong chess player, not in his class. Although in five-minute chess, as a matter of fact, I could often beat him at that time. Um, he wasn't probably able to make very clear what the assignment would be at Bletchley, isn't that no, right? No, although uh, my friend Bernard Scott had somehow guessed what, uh, what was being done in Bletchley. I don't know where he got his information. And we were interviewed at the same time. Bernard was rather kind to me because he said, wear your scarf inside your coat, not outside, just so you don't look like an undergraduate. <laughs> Even though we were both uh, possibly being interviewed for the same job, he still gave me advice. So then you must have been just out of uh, Oxford and Balliol. Well, I wasn't in Balliol. Um, I was at uh, Jesus College as a graduate student. I don't think I had yet got my PhD. I had a, a prize in mathematics, but I hadn't taken my, officially taken my doctorate at that time. Uh -huh. I'd been a student at Jesus College for about five years. Dr. Good, tell me, when did you first hear about code breaking and when did you uh, first learn what you were going to do when you arrived at Bletchley Park? Well, I first learned about code breaking in general, just as part of my general knowledge when I was, I suppose, about 12 or 13 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, the notion of a simple substitution appealed to me. That's a very trivial uh, code, of course, or cipher, whichever you like to call it, although it's a lot more sophisticated than the Caesar alphabet at any rate. Right. And I used to enjoy myself just breaking easy, simple substitutions when I was a child. But uh, at Bletchley, I first heard what was going on officially from Hugh Alexander, who met me at Bletchley Station. And uh, as we crossed the field, he told me what was going on there. Of course, he shouldn't have been so open when we weren't inside the office. Did that, did that talk make any kind of an impression on you? Oh yes, an enormous impression. I, it made it, it, I was extremely excited. We were just beginning to get into the naval enigma at that time. Mm -hmm. What was the time of that? When was that? That was um, the same day the Bismarck was sunk. Um, I think the 27th of May 1941. That's right. And uh, I remember someone coming in when I was in the office with his thumb down during the day. We knew that the Bismarck was being chased. That was just uh, public knowledge. So all he had to do was to, to make that sign, and uh, we knew what had happened. I see. Now, the Enigma was a German cipher machine, is that right? Yes. Used by all the German armed forces, and uh, the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy. And the Army, and or particularly the Air Force Enigma, had already been solved by that time. 
But the naval enigma was a more difficult task because of its keying method, and you were uh, assigned to work on that. Is that correct? Yes. There were also eight wheels in the library, so to speak, mm -hmm. three in the machine, but eight available. And I think they, I'm not sure, but I think at that time there were fewer on, on the Air Force. That's correct. The Air Force and the Army had only five. Oh, the Navy yes. had eight. Yes. Well, that increased the number of possible wheel orders to, I think, 336. Mm -hmm. Eight times seven times six, instead of 60, which is five times four times three. That's correct. So, uh, yes, a ratio of five or so extra just from that alone. And what did they have you doing? I mean, uh, how were you going about cracking this machine? What were you doing sitting at a desk? I suppose you were seated at a desk. What was your actual work? What did it consist of? Well, we, um, I was uh, in a, a kind of a mathematical se subsection of Hut 8, which is where the naval enigma was attacked. Mm -hmm. There was also a linguistic section. We were connected by uh, a little hatch. and. Uh, most of my work in that section was on a process called Banbarismus. Banbarismus? Yes, it was... Named for? Named after the town Banbury, where the sheets for uh, the process were printed. Mm -hmm. uh, as you say, a lot of the work was sitting at a desk, but also one had to get up frequently to have a look at the uh, punched sheets that went with the process which were in the middle of the room, and, and we would compare them to make sure that no mistakes had been made. And what, it, what were these sheets used for? Were, they, were those the ones that were placed one on top of another or something like that, if I remember correctly? Yes, they had punched holes so that when you compared them, one on top of the other, you could see where the same, le same cipher letter appeared on both sheets, if you had a black background, for example. So it was very convenient for finding so-called repeats. And you use this then to determine uh, the settings of the code wheels that form the, as it were, the heart of the enigma, as you mentioned, the eight code wheels, three at a time? Yes, the, the number of holes that you could see and whether they were close together and so on mm -hmm. would give you uh, probabilistic information of whether, in fact, the uh, comparison was just chance or whether it was, whether it really represented that the two messages uh, were enciphered in the same position. Right. Now, who are the, some of the people you, whom you were working with at this time uh, in HUD 8, which was the section solving the naval enigma? Turing was the head of the section. Alan Turing. Yes. Mm -hmm. There was Hugh Alexander, a guy named uh, Kendrick, uh, Peter Twin, Joan Clark, who uh, nearly married um, Turing mm -hmm. at one time, is now married. Her name is uh, Joan Murray now. She was uh, featured, if that's the right word, in the, uh, in the play, Breaking the Code, mm -hmm. which, of course, was about Turing. Right. Now, did Alan... I'm sorry, Karen. What was your first impression when you met Turing? Do you re recall the first it's conversation? Hard to say. I was somewhat awed by him. I don't really feel that I could do a thumbnail sketch on him except mentioning his idiosyncrasies that I discovered later on. He, se he seemed a little reserved, a little shy, perhaps. So he already had a reputation. You had already heard of his, uh, his genius as early on as the um, arrival. I'm not sure about that. I may be misremembering. Uh -huh. And had he, made, had he made any substantial contributions to code breaking to the solution of the enigma? as compared to his uncomputable numbers and other contributions to mathematics? Oh, yes. Well, he had a very uh, neat idea concerning the so-called bomb, which was a machine, a cryptanalytic machine, used mm -hmm. for the breaking of, uh, of the enigma. And uh, he, he did have a rather fundamental idea that I think could have miss, been missed for quite some time. You know, during the war, it wasn't like peacetime research when you had uh, several months to think of ideas and work them out in detail. Mm -hmm. It was a question, in many cases, it would be a question of who happened to think of something first. Uh, but I think we could have missed, I think we could have missed his idea for quite a, several months.
What was this idea? Can you explain it to us? Well, basically, it was based on the mathematical fact that from contradiction, uh, a logical contradiction, you can deduce everything. And curiously enough, although that sounds rather like logic chopping, it turned out to be rather important in this application. In a slight, slight gloss, of course. I mean, that alone doesn't explain it. Mm -hmm. But that's really the basis of the idea. And of course, he was familiar with that idea and had actually argued with the philosopher Wittgenstein that that idea was important and Wittgenstein would not accept that it was of any importance. So it turned out to be of considerable importance. And how did it uh, uh, manifest itself in these bombs, which were the code-breaking machines for the Enigma? Well, it meant that from a given assumption, if you, were making, if, you, if you were making an incorrect assumption about the settings of the machine, from a given, a given assumption, provided that your crib, if I may use the expression, mm -hmm. was of reasonable length, you would uh, you'd assume something about the plug board of the machine, and then the bomb would make all possible deductions for the, the same the same plugging of the letter that you were looking at. And on the other hand, if you were happen to be looking at the correct position of the settings, then it would only make, make one assumption. It couldn't contradict itself because it's, it, it started with a correct assumption. So all you had to do, I, I say all, I mean, this is an electronic problem, how you do it, would, or an ele electromagnetic perhaps, would be to look at the row, if, if I may use the expression, corresponding to the different possible assumptions and see whether they were nearly all empty or nearly all full. So there was a very quick test of whether you made the right assumption. And that saved a factor of 26 in the running time. I see. So if I understand this correctly, what was going on was that the British guessed the plain text or the original German of a message, matched it against the, germ, the intercepted German code message, and then the bomb ran through all these permutations of these wheels, and using this theorem or concept of Turing's, if this row was filled up, the machine would continue on because it meant that the assumption was wrong. As you said, from a single logical contradiction, everything would flow, and if it were correct, then the machine would stop, and you would be able to detect which were, which was at least one possible setting of these wheels which might be correct, and then you would test it on an actual enigma. Yes, I, I, as a matter of fact, missed out one possibility, and that is that the settings of the wheels are correct, the setting of the machine is correct, but you make an incorrect assumption. Uh, that was a case that I hadn't covered. Mm -hmm. And then you would get all deductions except one, except the correct one. Right. And that would also create a stop in the machine, is yes, that right? Yes, yes. Right. And uh, using this technique then, and with the help, I believe, of some captured documents, you were eventually able to go on and pretty much read the Germany naval enigma for a good part of the war. There was a blackout period, and then you continued once again. But then you moved on to the uh, other area of this new German machine, the Colossus. Uh, well, Tunney was the German machine. Tunney was the German machine. I'm sorry, correct. And how, why were you chosen for that amongst all the people who were working in Hut 8 on the German Naval Enigma or perhaps in the other huts uh, working on the Army or Air Force Enigma? It why was, were you picked out for it that? It was largely because the crib situation had become so good that uh, bamboorismus became rather unnecessary. I think that was the main reason. So the people who were doing bamboorismus were no longer needed in that? Yes, that's right, and I they see. tended to be dispersed. Right. And so you moved over then to this new machine. Now, how did that happen? And who was in charge? And uh, w how did it go from there? When I arrived in uh, what was called the Newmanry, because Max Newman was in charge. The Newmanry? Yeah, yeah. Yes. We, we yeah, like to use fancy words right. like that. Uh, there was um, a fairly small section. I think there were 16 wrens. There was one machine called a Heath Robinson, which had just started uh, being used. And of course, there was Max Newman. There were some engineers there. 
and there was Donald Mickey, who, who was the only other cryptanalyst there at that time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he'd been a classic scholar at uh, Balliol College. Uh, so uh, doing this kind of work was somewhat new to him, but he took to it very well and, um, and was very enthusiastic. Now, how far away, first of all, who was Max Newman? He was uh, a mathematician interested in logic and in topology. He'd written a book. Mm -hmm. um, he was a fellow of the Royal Society, and I suppose at that time he was probably in his early 40s. And he was from Cambridge? Yes. Right. And why was he chosen for this job? Do you have any idea? Uh, well, partly uh, he came voluntarily to Bletchley because he wanted to help with the war. And he was in a section at first called, or perhaps uh, uh, earlier, uh, uh, called the Testery. He may have been in the research section uh, before the major, that. Uh, may, this is Major Tester's Testery. That's that right, it? yes. Right. Uh, but he didn't take to the work there. He didn't like it. He felt... What, was, what were they doing there? What were they doing there? They were working on tunny, of course, but they mm -hmm. were using hand methods. Right. And some of those were very, lab <clears throat> very laborious. And um, he felt that they were, some of them, the ones that didn't involve any language at all, ought to be mechanized. And he felt very strongly about this. Mm -hmm. He also felt that he wasn't really competent at doing the work himself because I think he compared himself with some of the other people there who were very, very good. I'm thinking mm -hmm. especially of Peter Hilton, right. for example. So he became discouraged, so he had an extra reason for wanting to mechanize the process and get, uh, get out of having to do it by hand. So he went to... Um, uh, Travis, uh, Edward Travis, and said that we ought to try to uh, do this work by electronic machinery. He knew, probably knew of the existence of the bomb, which was, uh, of course, being used against the, mm -hmm. uh, against the Enigma. And uh, uh, Sir Edward, of course, encouraged him, and uh, that's how it got started. And, uh, Ed, excuse me, I just want to clarify one thing. Edward Travis was the head of Bletchley Park, the head of the entire, uh, well, actually, services code breaking. He was not in charge of the diplomatic. That was in charge of uh, Alastair Denniston, who had been his predecessor as head of the whole thing. Oh, yes, that's right. Well, Denniston may have been may have been in charge. I may be wrong when I said that he went to Sir Edward Travis. It may have been Denniston. What, what time was this? When was this? Uh, that would probably be in the mid-40s, I should think. Well, then by then, uh, uh, Denniston, who was then Commander Denniston. I mean, the middle uh, of 19... Uh, Commander Travis. 1940, I mean, not the mid-40s. In the middle of 1940. Oh, 1940, probably. Denniston was still in charge. I see. Yes. Right. Anyhow, that's who we went to. Yes, Karen, I'm sorry. How closely did you work with uh, Donald Mickey? Were you... Um, deciphering or working on the same messages together? How close was the teamwork, if at all? At first, we realized that the uh, machine called the Heath Robinson was not working too well. Sometimes it caught fire and so on. Um, but uh, there were also problems of not really knowing what runs should be done. We did some research on the uh, statistical properties of language and of the characteristics of the patterns of the machine, mm -hmm. and uh, we worked very well together. We were friends from the start. What would happen when a message came over, um, I guess, the wires, um, and how did you know which ones to, how, how did you prioritize the work? The prioritization, if I may use a horrible expression, was, was uh, done to some extent by the intelligence people. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, much later, we were told that the most important link was usually a link called jellyfish between, uh, I think, Stuttgart or Strasbourg and Paris. Strasbourg is not the city in France. Strasbourg was a, a communic cent communication center just outside Berlin. Oh, yes. It, it was a different Strasbourg. They had similar names. I'm I sorry, see. I didn't mean to I correct. see. Okay, I didn't know that. Yes. 
Uh, in fact, um, some of that traffic was ex of very great importance later on, that particular link. It happened to be easier to solve than some of the others, less of a challenge. It was a bit disappointing when we were told that we should concentrate on jellyfish. So when a message came, uh, can you give us an example of what it was like when you were working on a message together and working closely? Um, um, it's hard to say. I mean, we didn't exactly work on a message by ourselves. We were helped by the machinery. Uh, what we did was deciding what should be tried next if something went wrong, mm -hmm. and also find out what, why it had gone wrong. Sometimes it was simply because certain tapes had been incorrectly produced by the wrens. I mean, they were but fallible. Uh, it was difficult to produce the tapes in a way because you had to count the number of characters. There was a little hand counter for counting the length of a tape, and it had to be exactly right. How long would a message be on average? In, in Tani, they were very often thousands of characters long. We called those messages. They were really under, underlying it. They were really several messages placed end to end in plain language. They liked sending out a lot of stuff all in one go on a long tape. The longest tape I read recently was 60,000 characters long, but we quite often had them in the length, say 15,000. What were some of the greatest challenges in uh, the longest messages that you worked on? Well, the longest messages were the easiest. Oh. <laughs> because they gave more information. So uh, that was fine. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the shortest messages were. We probably never even tried to uh, break in, so to speak, on a short message. I don't know. I don't remember. Did you, did you use the same technique with uh, Tunney as you did with the Enigma? In other words, guessing at cribs and then trying to match them up and then uh, going from that to a reconstruction of the original keying of the German machine? Cribs would have been looked at only in the testery. In the machine section, we never used or hardly ever tried to use any kind of linguistic information. So what did you use? How did you go about breaking it? It was statistical. You analyzed the statistics of the intercepted message and from those attempted to deduce the settings of the key wheels and the positions of the pins and lugs and all of that on them? Yes. Yes, that's right. Right. Can I go back a little bit uh, earlier on? Uh, where was the Newman re and what did it look like? Originally, it was a, a hut, you know, one of those... One of those uh, Quonset huts. Or were they, they weren't actually, they were long, narrow buildings, right? Yes. Um, I don't know what they were constructed out of, but uh, they looked as if they were constructed out of cardboard, more or less. Um, but then, uh, when we began using large machines like the Colossus, we moved into a brick building. We still were called Hut F, by the way. Mm -hmm. And then later on, we had so many Colossi that we needed yet another brick building mm -hmm. called Hut H. The word hut was still used. Right. And uh, how many people worked in, uh, at the start at least, in the Newmanry? Well, when I arrived, as I say, there were about 16 wrens, two mm -hmm. or three, if you include Newman, three cryptanalysts, uh, maybe half a dozen maintenance engineers or a little more. Mm -hmm. And of course, there were also engineers in the background who weren't working at Bletchley much of the time. And later on, when the Colossi were being built, half the uh, Dollis Hill Research Station, which was the telephone research station, was working on producing colossi. Right. But they, they, were, they, they didn't even know what they were working on, most of them. They were not, they were not at, at Bletchley Park. They were up at Dollis Hill, is that That's right? That's right, right, yes. So if you walked into the Newmanry, what would you see? Would you see desks? Would you see people working with screwdrivers to put these machines together? And uh, what would you hear and what would you smell? What would it be like in there? Um, well, it was rather hot because of the heat produced by the Heath Robinson. In the early days, of course, mm -hmm. I'm referring to now, you did ask me, you know, the size of the department in the early days, although I slipped into saying that half the Dollis Hill research station mm -hmm. was involved. That was much later, of course. Um, 
there was an air of informality but devotion to work mm -hmm. which you expected during World War II. There was hardly anybody I think in the country who didn't have that feeling that this guy, this mega murderer was someone that needed to be disposed of. Mm -hmm. And uh, were, were you seated at desks and were there people, as I say, putting machines together in the same room? No, uh, only maintenance people came into that particular right. room. There was another room, I think, where they worked on other types of equipment. And, of course, they also had to produce a simulated tunny machine, because when mm -hmm. you did break into a message, you wanted to decipher it, and you didn't want to do that by hand, if it was right. thousands of letters long. So this uh, simulated tunny machine was simply called tunny sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the bombs which were used to decipher this entirely different machine, the Enigma, were huge things. They were about five or six feet high, if I remember, maybe a little more, and about seven or eight feet wide and a foot or two thick, if that's correct. Uh, yes, Am I right on that? Except I think uh, I was only once in the place, the hut, where they uh, had these machines, and mm -hmm. I think it was taller than a man. You may I, be right. I think it may have been about seven feet high. Mm -hmm. Now, how big was the Heath Robinson, and how big then was Colossus in comparison with these? The Heath Robinson this big, or...? Oh, no, oh, it was larger than that. It was something like four feet wide, I should say, about five feet high, and about um, 18 inches thick. And did it have flashing lights and things like that on it? Oh, yes. It, it was did. quite impressive for, yes. uh, at that time in history. Uh -huh. And I think it probably had about 30... Vacuum, well, they weren't vacuum tubes, perhaps I should call them tubes. They were thyrotrons, which were gas-filled mm -hmm. tubes. Of the order of 30, but that's just a guess on my part. Right. That was the Heath Robinson. Mm -hmm. And then you moved from that into the Colossus, is that right? Yes. And, and the, that was how big? The Colossus, I should say, was about... Uh, mm, about 11 feet wide, about six feet high and about four feet thick, something like that. Mm. The first Colossus had 1,500 valves, and that, which made it very probably the largest electronic machine that had ever existed at the time. Mm -hmm. And did it, uh, did it have flashing lights and uh, did it have sprockets and things running around such as tapes of intercepted messages, anything like that? Oh yes. Well, on the Heath Robinson there were two tapes for input, and uh, this meant that uh, you had to drive them by their sprocket holes in order to keep those engaged, mm -hmm. and that tended to stretch the tape somewhat. That was one of the difficulties with Heath Robinson. Now, Tom Flowers, who designed the Colossus, uh, realized that, they, that this problem of having two tapes could be overcome by putting vastly more electronics inside the machine to represent one of the tapes. That's why it had, well, 1,500 uh, valves at first. The second one had 2,400, I think. And uh, since the tape was now being driven by pulleys and not by its sprockets, there wasn't a serious problem of the tape breaking. Mm -hmm. They did occasionally, but rather rarely break. And was it, well, presumably it was worth it to uh, replace one of these tapes with the vacuum tubes, is that right? I mean, you, it seems like there's a much greater expense and uh, danger of these tubes burning out and all of that as compared to an occasional tape breaking. The expense didn't matter much. Mm -hmm. uh, the speed of producing it was the important thing. Uh, oh, but um, the number of valves did discourage some people. They didn't believe that the machine could possibly be reliable with that number of valves or tubes. Mm -hmm. But Tom Flowers knew that if you did not turn the machine on or off, that it, could, it would become reliable after the initial teething troubles. I see. And is this move from tape to... Uh to the vacuum tubes with material, I suppose, stored in them. Is that any kind of a step towards the development of a computer? Was that a major step? I think the engineers who worked on Colossus probably learned quite a lot of el electronics, and that probably paid some of them uh, well in 
uh, later life if they got involved in computing. I think some of the information must have got through, and especially through Tom Flowers and uh, the people who worked with him. That's what I was going to ask. How did your experience with Colossus condition your work later on with computers? Well, in my case, uh, I think my experience with Colossus led me to suggest uh, a, an idea, just to suggest it, not to work it out in detail, which would later be called mi microprogramming. Because the idea there was to uh, construct basic instructions by means of very elementary Boolean operations, which is, in effect, what more or less what the Colossus had been doing. Uh, so it was a fairly natural uh, uh, suggestion to make. Wilkes didn't know about that, I don't think, when he suggested macro-programming, and our aims were somewhat different. He thought of this process as something that would be of use to the hardware engineers constructing a machine, mm -hmm. whereas I thought of it as something that the user of a computer might want to do if he felt the need for a new type of elementary instruction. Instead of writing a subroutine, which is what would be done today in, in nearly every case, he would construct basic instructions as the idea. Uh, and different users might want to construct different basic instructions. For example, mm -hmm. counting the number of ones in a word or something which hadn't, had, not, had not been thought worthwhile having might be useful for, for one of the users. So he could just set this up, and if he later got onto different work, he could change the basic instructions. That was the idea. Nice. And I think almost certainly that, that I had this idea because of my experience with Colossus. It wasn't influential, I might mention. Mm -hmm. It was ignored completely, except that, Tur uh, that um, uh, Newman did uh, mention it, but I think he had rethought it for himself about six months later mm -hmm. and discussed it with the uh, people at the National Physical Laboratory. So it might have got through, you know, through the grapevine. After all, by the time I told three people and, uh, and Newman had told a few more, that was already about 70% of the people working on electronic computers in England. <laughs> I see. Um, what, the, what I was getting at, when asking about the move from tape to electronic uh, tubes was whether this was a move towards stored, uh, stored programs or stored programming. Is that, uh, can it be looked at that way? Well, the trouble is I'm not quite sure how to define stored programming, really. Me either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it rather depends. Obviously, there was a program there that was plugged up. It wasn't something that would change uh, in the course of a run, mm -hmm. uh, except that we could, as a matter of fact, by hand, change a program because, just because it was plugged and, and we had toggle switches right. and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in stored programming, you, uh, you don't do that. You uh, run a program with the stored program uh, in the machine. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite sure, really, quite how to answer it, but um, I, I'm sure Donald Mickey could answer that better than I can. Mm. Tell us why you were working on this. I know you weren't able to think 30 years ahead and imagine computers as they are today, but uh, how were you working or concentrating on the task assigned you, namely solving German messages. Apparently, you were not the ones who were actually translating these messages from German into English or running them through the machine so that they would be in German. But what were you doing? I mean, the messages I know would come in by tape, uh, either radioed in or uh, sometimes brought in by uh, courier. What would you do with these tapes once you got them? We would uh, choose a tape very often being influenced, as I said just now, by the intelligence uh, sections as to what was of higher priority. Mm -hmm. And we would then stick it into a loop so that it could run round and round. And then the uh, reins would put this on the machine on the pulleys. And we would start off with uh, various runs. Now, uh, at first, we 
had to experiment a bit with what were the best runs to do. So we would sit at the machine and be in synergy with the machine and with the wren. So you had man, woman and machine in synergy, uh, shouting out instructions for what uh, changes should be made in the program. Such as, what would you shout out? You'd say, oh, uh, plug uh, three to two, level three to level two or something like that. And uh, meanwhile, the machine was printing out stuff on an electromatic typewriter. I'm talking about the Colossus, mm -hmm. of course, giving you the results of runs. Uh, if if you, you got a very high score on a run, you'd believe that there was a high probability that you'd had success on that run, and then you'd have to decide what should be the next run. Mm -hmm. Later on, uh, we made decision trees so that the wrens could take over and simply do, according to certain fixed rules, a sequence of um, a sequence of runs without the help of a cryptanalyst. Mm -hmm. And if then it failed, then the printout and uh, the alphabet, uh, in a certain sense, would be typed out, and this would be given to a duty officer to consider what should be done next if we had not succeeded at that stage. Now, uh, go on, Karen, I'm sorry. I was going to jump ahead, perhaps, and ask what was the most important strategic message that you cracked? Well, I can't be sure about that, but in Tunney, uh, it was probably some jellyfish messages, as I said, between uh, Paris and, uh, what was it, Strasbourg? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that ha had an enormous impact on the war in Europe, apparently. About uh, movements of infantry or uh, battleships, what kind of? Ah, well, not battleships in the case of Tunney. This would be the German army. I see. Uh, it, uh, it was highly influential, according to Sir Harry Hensley's history of British intelligence in World War II. That was a, a very important period. The exact message, of course, I don't know. We, we obeyed a principle of the need to know for the most part, as in any intelligence organization. Mm -hmm. You weren't told things that your so-called superiors or actual superiors thought you didn't need to know. Mm -hmm. When you did know, how did it feel to have made that kind of contribution? Well, it made you feel, uh, it gave you a Napoleonic complex. <laughs> <laughs> you said at one point, I think I heard you say uh, earlier, one time earlier, uh, that you and Donald Mikey had been working at Colossus, one in front, one in back, and you were attacking some particular problem and achieved some kind of a breakthrough. I don't know what this was, I don't know what the problem was or what the breakthrough is, and I wonder if you could tell us. Well, the whole purpose of the Colossus was to carry out by machine processes that had been done by hand, but of course doing them much faster, which of course is the purpose of an electronic computer. Right. Um, now, uh, amongst these hand processes, there was one called uh, setting, let me call it, when you know what the patterns of the wheels are, um, you set messages one at a time. And there's another process which, uh, it, it, which requires the finding, the solving of the patterns, which would be fixed maybe for a day, at first I think for a month, and, and then later for a day or so. And uh, that was the, so to speak, the, um, the break into the day. Now, mm -hmm. as I say, both of these were being done by hand. But we thought of the purpose of Colossus as the setting problem. And we got into a rut, and we, it didn't occur to any of us until Donald Mickey thought that perhaps uh, the finding of the patterns also might be solvable on the same machine. So he came in one morning with this bright idea, and um, as you said, he uh, worked at the back of the machine, and mm -hmm. I worked at the front helping him. And really, the uh, effort was uh, certainly mainly his. He made a mistake, which I noticed, so I made some contribution apart from just, you know, working at the front of the machine. Um, and that vastly extended the value of the Colossus. That was a very important breakthrough. Mm -hmm. 
And in fact, uh, the, uh, uh, the method led to additional equipment that was installed in later colossi by Tom Flowers. Tom Flowers was extremely good. You can't imagine anyone who could be more helpful. And he was regarded as an absolute wizard at electronics. As soon as he heard of a problem, he would draw out roughly what the circuits ought to be and then tear up the sheet. This is mm -hmm. all in the literature and give it to his, um, his uh, band of brothers, as it was called sometimes in the uh, an article by Coombs, and they would get to work, and uh, they would uh, produce what was required, and he nearly always, I think, perhaps even always, got things right the first time. I wonder, you know, the Germans had uh, uh, decoding machines as well, or code-breaking machines. They were always mechanical. I wonder, or electromechanical. I wonder why the British moved from electromechanical machines into purely electronic. Do you know who took that giant step? It's difficult for me to tell, but I can I might guess that it was something to do with the telecommunications research establishment, mm -hmm. um, who may have been using electronics in connection with radar. And uh, the Heath Robinson, or the first designer, was someone, the head of, of the engineering, was a man named Wynne Williams, mm -hmm. uh, who worked at the uh, at TRE. So that could have been it. Uh, but Turing happened to know about Flowers. Turing was the man who put Newman onto Flowers as being someone who might be able to produce a better machine. He knew uh, Turing had got to know of, of Flowers' reputation. I think it's because he considered the possibility of, of making an electronic machine out of the bomb, which was electromagnetic. And Turing had thought of this. Uh, yes, yeah. I think that's why he got into contact oh, with uh, Dollis Hill and then with Flowers. But that was decided against. It was decided it w uh, that wasn't a, a good investment. But at least that's how he had the personal contact with mm. Flowers. It's I interesting that that was uh, considered not a good investment. Do you have any idea why and the other one was? Um, well, the other was um, a kind of analog machine that was doing a lot of work simultaneously. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was really a very parallel machine. Right. And it, um, <clears throat> it, so it got its speed by, by being a very parallel machine. And apparently, to make, at that stage in electronics, to have produced an electronic machine doing the same thing would have been um, unnecessary or you know, not quite convincingly worth the effort, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And what was the actual, when we get back to the Colossus, what was it actually doing? I mean, what kind of tests was it running? Why did it need two input tapes? This isn't clear to me. The Heath Robinson did need. Two, two input tapes. tapes. Yes. One yeah, of them was the original cipher tape, mm -hmm. and one was uh, something to do with the uh, settings of the machine. You know, some function mm -hmm. um, of the of the wheel patterns if the if the wheel patterns were known. So there were these two tapes that, in some sense or other, had to be matched against one another, and that meant running them round and round. It also meant that the lengths of the two tapes had to be mutually prime in order to make sure that all relative positions were, were run I through. See, I see. Right. And so at all possible positions of these two tapes, then, you ran them through to test to see whether certain statistical patterns would emerge. Is that what it was? Um, in a nutshell, yes. Mm -hmm. Or whether certain tests, uh, statistical tests, were satisfied significance tests. Mm -hmm. And if they were satisfied, what would that show you? It would show you that you pro were probably correct. You could even work out perhaps the probability by using so-called Bayesian methods of mm -hmm. statistics. You could say the probability of this is correct is such and such if you wanted to. But in so-called non-Bayesian statistics, you'd simply say that uh, a certain P-value, as it's called, the tail area probability had been reached, and it was too surprising uh, to not to believe, in mm -hmm. effect. But of course, there were marginal cases, right? And sometimes you would do the next run in the hope that it would show that things were better than had been clearly shown in the first run. 
And then once you got these statistical tests uh, came out, say, very strong in particular cases, how would this lead you back to the settings, the starting setting of, settings of the wheel in the Geheimschreiber and the positions of the pins and all of that? Um, so long as you knew the patterns, then you were setting. Um, then when you got a highly significant result, mm -hmm. it meant that you had found the correct initial settings, positions, angular positions right. of, the, of the wheels that were used in that particular run. Uh, that's in effect what you were doing, finding the settings of the wheels. Later on, this other process, um, in a nutshell, for a modern statistician, uh, we were putting it, a little misleadingly, but more or less, uh, we were finding the singular vectors of a matrix. That makes it very clear. <laughs> now I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, that, as I say, is a nutshell. Right. I see. And uh, did you get any feedback from uh, higher-ups about successful messages, which is what Karen was asking about earlier? Well, by the time you'd finished all, the, all your work, you just knew it was right, and um, the decipherment on our simulated tunny would actually show you some German. Mm -hmm. uh, so you knew then that you had things substantially right, at least. Of course, you might have a one instead of a zero or something like that on the pattern, in which right. case this would come out as a, as a, a garble, as it was called, in the German. But since there were garbles anyway through transmission right. uh, to some extent, uh, I don't know whether that would have made much difference to the, uh, to, the, uh, to, the uh, to the intelligence people. However, I imagine that if, uh, and this I'm just reconstructing now mm -hmm. because I don't remember this, I imagine if they found too many garbles like that, they would say, oh, you must have something a bit wrong here, and we would mm -hmm. uh, recheck. I see. Now, dozens of messages, no doubt, were coming in each day. And you couldn't solve every day's messages, I don't believe. There were days when the statistical tests wouldn't work or something uh, didn't produce anything. How did you know when to stop working on a particular day's traffic and uh, uh, to uh, shift over to something else and begin working on a new day's traffic? Well, for the, uh, bra the breaking of the patterns problem, uh, the so-called wheel breaking problem. There was a significance test which I worked out, a um, mm -hmm. little bit sophisticated, <clears throat> um, and that's how we could tell whether uh, the beginning run was successful. Later on it would make itself clear whether it was successful or not. If the significance test failed to work, we would often try anyway and nearly always, when the significance test failed to work, we didn't succeed in, in, in later runs. It were, it, apparently, the significance test proved itself in the eating, as it were. I see. I just have one final question, which is this. Was this work satisfying to you, and if so, why? Um, it was entertaining as a game, to begin with. And, of course, it was satisfying because we knew we were helping to win the war. We were doing something substantial and something much more important than we had ever done before. I think that's very true. And if I may just conclude, my own researches have shown that uh, certainly in the Battle of the Atlantic, months and thousands of lives were saved. And I think it certainly must have been true for the Geheimschreiber and Tunney, where you must have shortened the war considerably by the intelligence you were gaining, which could be applied effectively by the Allied command and so saved thousands of lives, and people now alive today might not have been but for your work. That's true, I think. Uh -huh. Okay. We've been joined now by Donald Mickey, who is Director for Advanced Study at the Turing Institute in Glasgow, and who during the war was a code breaker, working among other people with Alan Turing. And I'd like to ask Donald, who uh, 
was a classical scholar at Balliol and not a mathematician, Balliol, Oxford, how he got into the code-breaking work, particularly on the mathematical side. I uh, volunteered to an establishment in Bedford to be taught a Japanese course in the uh, early summer of 1942, having left uh, my high school early. Of, and uh, But I got the date wrong, time of year wrong, and the interviewing officer had pity on me and said that if I packed my bags and got there within the next uh, 48 hours, I could sign on, meanwhile, for a codes and ciphers course, which might interest me. It interested me very much. I didn't have anything else to do in the evening but to go back and push on with the course. Mm -hmm. And uh, after quite a short time, a few weeks, the Colonel Pritchard came over from Bletchley because he was recruiting uh, in connection with the setting up of the testery and the push from Newman, which followed shortly after that. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they ca told you about codes and ciphers instead of uh, how to shoot a cannon or something like that? Well, this uh, uh, government uh, training school I went to, that happened to be the next course that was starting on a Monday, and I was being interviewed on a Thursday. I see. <laughs> so they said, if, you, if you're quick about it, we'll let you into this course to fill in the time. But it turned out to be more than time filling because Bletchley started to a wave of recruiting. And then so I got pulled into the net. And then you went on over to Bletchley? Immediately, yes. Right, and you went where when you were over there? Immediately into the... I, no, I was parked for a, two, a couple of weeks or so, two or three weeks in the main building, um, learning some basics. And before I left, I, I remember one of my chores was to teach, uh, or try to teach, Roy Jenkins, who you may have heard of, how to read punch paper tape uh, code, mm -hmm. um, teleprint uh, punch paper tape. And I went directly over to the testery, uh, where he followed almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And what did you do in the testery? What was your job there? Um, our main work was uh, doing exploiting by hand methods certain kinds of mistakes that the German operators made when they didn't uh, obey their own instructions and produced what's referred to in Himsley's book and which we also call depths. Uh, namely, one and the same message uh, in the easiest case, gets transmitted twice on the same machine, the same cipher, the same patterns, the same setting, except the second time the tape is put in uh, at a slide of so many characters relative to the, f to the first transmission. Uh, they think something's gone wrong with the first transmission, mm -hmm. so just for luck they send it again. And then what you get is um, if you add the two together by a certain kind of logical addition, uh, the key is common to both, so that disappears and you're left mm -hmm. with a message in German, military German, which has been added to itself at a certain stagger. So that was the easy case. Uh, um, more difficult uh, stuff is where you've actually got two completely different messages. Um, but uh, they've been uh, transmitted on the same machine, same patterns, same setting. And then what you have is the Boolean sum of mm -hmm. uh, two quite different messages, one added to the other. And by a certain amount of low cunning, uh, it's sometimes possible to uh, unscramble the two. Mm -hmm. uh, in either case, either the easy case or the difficult case, then you have an opportunity to uh, produce pure key. Um, so I suppose that was the commonest thing that we were doing. But uh, there was also an operation called Turingismus, which was <laughs> derived initially from Alan Turing, and it was in connection with that that I uh, consulted him. 
And then you went on over to the Newman Re. Yes, I was Newman's first appointee when he was setting up. That must have been in May 1943, um, when the uh, first Heath Robinson machine was delivered. And uh, Jack showed up about uh, two or three weeks later. And what was your job uh, in the Newman Re? What were you doing there? Well, our official job from Max Newman, who was a very driving personality, was to use the Heath Robinson in the style that it had been conceptualized, envisaged, to get results. Uh, because he was somewhat beleaguered, having got funds, and he wanted results to justify it. And Jack and I, in the daytime, obediently went through the motions, but in our hearts, we knew that so many things were prototype and provisional and as yet unresearched that unless the equipment could be used to do fundamental research on the statistical structure of the problem, the chances were not too good. So we got into the habit, um, unknown to Max Newman as far as I know, uh, with one or two helpers in staying on in evening shifts using the Heath Robinson to do this type of research and collect data of a kind which was then absolutely invaluable on which systematic methods could be built uh, and which did in fact justify Newman. How would you describe the way that you worked together? Was it uh, a collaboration or a, a just a healthy teamwork or even healthy competition between you? What was it like? Well, between Jack and me as two individuals? Yes. Oh, co uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. That's typical scientific collaboration. How did you divide up what you were going to, the way you would tackle something? Two people working close together get a sixth sense about each other's profiles, strong and weak points, uh, fill in for each other's gaps and stuff and problems, sub-problems get broken up, passed backwards and forwards. Uh -huh. It's hard to be very specific. I think that's fair enough, except for one little job that I did on the side, <clears throat> that Bree message that I mentioned. But I don't think one so, needs to go into details on that particularly. Uh -huh. Would you like to talk about some of your strengths and uh, how you balanced uh, the qualities that the other lacked? Ah, well, this is difficult, uh, but um, Jack is, uh, was and is one of the outstanding applied mathematicians of the generation. Max Newman said of him, uh, to me, and I believe these are the right words, actually, the metaphor of the gun, that uh, Jack Good is like as a mathematician, like a loaded gun, just uh, point him in the right direction and he could demolish anything. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that uh, anything which required other than surface mathematics, obviously, uh, that was for Jack. And however large the section became and however mighty, many mighty mathematicians came into it, including Henry Whitehead that uh, Jack mentioned, uh, if some real hard uh, nut had to be cracked in the mathematical sense, it tended to land on, on uh, Jack's uh, plate. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, think it's much easier to talk about one's weaknesses than, than strengths, which uh, I'm not sure I know too much about. Uh, but certainly we, we fitted and uh, made a good team. After uh, you worked there to the end of the war, is that right? Hmm. And then what happened? Did you continue t your teamwork elsewhere? Did you go your own separate ways? What happened at the end of the war? We went our separate ways uh, professionally. We just uh, stayed in touch as friends uh, on and off uh, ever mm -hmm. since. Um, we made a, one or two uh, rather uncompleted uh, efforts of collaboration on one or two problems and we even published a joint paper I remember on Mackey's paradox. Oh yes, that was about eight years ago yeah. or something. 
but uh, in general we've just been so busy with our own stuff mm -hmm. that the opportunity uh, hasn't to Well, hasn't what did you do? And then I'd like to ask Jack what he did. What did you do after the war? Where did you go and what interests drove you there and did this, in particular, did this wartime experience propel you in that direction? Oh, the wartime experience completely disabled me for the career that I had planned, <laughs> which was uh, to follow up my classical scholarship, which I had to Oxford. Mm -hmm. And I arrived uh, in the fall of 1945. Arrived where, at Oxford? Yes, uh, at Badial. And dutifully began to apply my nose to the grindstone again in Latin and Greek, language, history, philosophy, and so forth. After the Bletchley experience, I just found that uh, unbearable, uh, unbearably dull uh, letdown and went to my um, advisor, I think in the college called him a moral tutor, but every student had one, and said, it's no good. Uh, I really can't uh, face any anymore. I'm trying my best. So he said, well, what would you like to do? So I said, I don't really know, but maybe being uh, doing something in medicine would be at least useful to somebody. I said, I suppose you realize that uh, you have to do prelim science first, and you're 22, and you did never, you don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, anything about uh, botany, zoology, physics, or chemistry. And he was right. <laughs> so <laughs> I sat down and um, over the years, did the prelim science and went through preclinical medical school. And by the time I graduated in anatomy and physiology. From Oxford? I, uh, yes. yes. I was then um, rather busy, uh, spare time hobby, doing genetics experiments with, with uh, pet mice. And uh, this grew. And in fact, by that time, I already had the loan of a hut in the zoology department to follow up this research. And the reader in genetics, uh, E.B. Ford, died recently, um, persuaded me. I didn't need much persuasion to do my DPhil, as we call it, uh, my doctorate in genetics uh, at Oxford. So that, and that, that led to a 15-year career as a biologist. I was a geneticist. At Oxford? No, no, no. Immediately after my PhD or DPhil, I uh, joined uh, Medawar's department mm -hmm. uh, in London and with uh, Anne McLaren. Uh, we worked there and elsewhere in London for six years uh, before um, I, uh, well, we both accepted different posts in Edinburgh and I was in the Department of Surgical Science in Edinburgh mm -hmm. until uh, 1960 or thereabouts, uh, when uh, a learning machine that I had been building arising out of a bet with a colleague attracted some attention. And coming out of that, I was uh, asked over to Stanford uh, in 1961. And what I saw there completely uh, assured me that the light that had always been at the end of the tunnel of maybe getting back to the topics that we'd been discussing during the war mm -hmm. uh, was now a practical proposition that there were actual computing facilities to do work in artificial intelligence. Can we come back to that a little bit later? Yes, and sure. um, focus on Jack's post-war experience. What did you do after the war? Well, I joined um, Max Newman's mathematics department at Manchester. He had recently become a full professor um, in Manchester, having previously been in Cambridge, and he was now building up his mathematics department. So he hired me as a uh, lecturer and also with minor or subsidiary interests in a computer project that he hoped he would get going in Manchester. He obviously was influenced by his previous experience during the World War in wanting to have a computing centre. And he predicted that computing would be a, multi, a multi-million dollar industry. He was one of the few people who realised that was so. 
I don't think he guessed that it would be a multi-billionaire, a billion dollar industry, but certainly he didn't fall into the trap that many of us did of thinking that one computer would be sufficient for all the needs in, in the United Kingdom. Oh, were you skeptical of his prediction at that time then as I well? was skeptical um, uh, because I knew that one computer could do all the computing that was then being done. But of course the tools um, uh, develop needs as G.B. Stibitz pointed out in one of his papers early on mm -hmm. uh, from direct experience. Uh, so Newman's prediction was right, but he wanted the computer to deal with non-numerical work, in fact with pure mathematics, and I was a bit skeptical about that. But he did have a shot at uh, some problems on group theory with David Rees, who, whom he also brought over from Bletchley mm -hmm. as an assistant lecturer. Was it around that time that you became interested in the idea of intelligent machines and thinking machines? As well? um, yes. I, as a consequence, I think, mainly of conversations with Turing during the war, um, I thought uh, I was also fascinated, though not to the extent that Turing was obsessed with the notion of producing thinking machines, so I was quite interested in them. And in fact, in 1958, in the, uh, I think, December, I was invited by IBM to evaluate the perceptron, uh, which had just been started by Frank Rosenblatt. And I thought it was a rather good idea, but I was unimpressed by his mathematical proofs. But uh, I was, I think, the first person to do an evaluation of the perceptron. Was that at the Watson Research Center in the United uh, States? It, it, more or less. It was Mahansic Laboratory, which is close to Yorktown Heights. Uh -huh. And uh, in fact, I was there just for a few weeks and uh, wrote two papers for them. One was on the kind of mathematics that might come into information retrieval. These were half debaked ideas, you know. I'm, I like speculating about science, and especially in those days. Mm -hmm. In fact, I edited a book called The Scientist Speculates. But you said a moment ago that you were um, uh, dubious about the perceptron. Uh, is it, can you elaborate on that? I was somewhat dubious about Newman's um, ambition at that time, at least over the short term, mm -hmm. of devoting all the, uh, the machine effort in Manchester to mathematics, pure mathematics. I thought that the time wasn't ripe, and I was probably right in that, in that judgment. Um, it was used, in fact, for number crunching for quite a time as its main activity. Mm -hmm. There was such a demand for number crunching, as I say, once people discovered that they could do number crunching, most people wanted to do more and more, and more of it. Mm -hmm. And do you have any um, predictions that you made uh, that you'd like to recount to us that you found were correct, in, or your speculations then as a scientist that were correct about how things unfolded in computer science and artificial intelligence? I can't remember all my speculations, but... My um, favorite one. Well, I, I was interested in, in chess as a field, as, as Donald was. In fact, uh, he and Sean Wiley produced a little program very early on, just a one-move analyzer. And in one of my letters to Turing, I said that uh, one could easily beat this by psychological play, that is, by complicating the game, mm -hmm. if it was only looking one move ahead. And I also, in a postscript, to, this, to one of my letters in 1948 to him, pointed out that a machine should not just look a certain number of moves ahead, but should look ahead until the position became, in modern terminology, quiescent. And I, I think that, although of course that wasn't published, I think it may have been an early written statement to that effect, that uh, some kind of a tree that was not just cut off uniformly like a prunes tree, but went forward wherever it was found necessary when the position was not quiescent until it became quiescent. It was one of the early ideas which occurs in, in Shannon's paper on chess mm -hmm. uh, as an example. I think perhaps I might have influenced Turing for a change. I mean, Turing certainly influenced me in many ways, but um, I think perhaps I might have influenced him on that, in that postscript. Mm -hmm. 
um, in our more informal conversations, you had sounded out a warning about uh, con uh, control uh, being um, handed over to intelligent machines. Maybe you could comment on that. Yes, here well, I wrote a paper in 1965 called Speculations Concerning the First Ultra Intelligent Machine. And I started off that letter by banging a gong by saying the survival of humanity depends on the early construction of an ultra-intelligent machine. Um, but I also realized that this was also dangerous, mm -hmm. that uh, such a machine, if we, do, if we weren't careful, would take everything over, an idea that's been taken up in science fiction, of course. And um, uh, the question, for example, would arise of the social repercussions of having such a machine, it would certainly produce social repercussions, unemployment perhaps, because the machine would construct robots and so on for doing manual work in addition to all the scientists becoming unemployed. Um, and um, the question then that I would address to the ultra-intelligent machine was how to cure these difficulties. The machine might say, well, you'd better turn me off. I don't know what it would say. But, but you're not sure you would get a direct or an even honest answer. Well, there's that danger too, especially if an idea which came up uh, some time ago uh, was put into effect of letting the machines, so to speak, fight it out by natural selection amongst themselves. Because if they got into the habit of, of self-preservation, then they would become even more dangerous than uh, if they were regarded as tools of humanity. Mm -hmm. you, may, you mentioned science fiction a moment ago. Are you a, a, an avid reader of science fiction? I used to read a lot of science fiction at one time. Um, I had one idea which I discovered later had been anticipated by Isaac Asimov. Which one is that? Well, I thought of all the ultra-intelligent entities in outer space. It seemed to me there would be good reason to, th to believe they existed if there is life in outer space, and I think that's, you know, I felt that was probable, mm -hmm. and that they would be hundreds of millions of years ahead of us in all probability, because a hundred million years is not much compared with the age of the universe. Uh -huh. And that therefore they would be so incredibly advanced that we could hardly imagine uh, what they would be like. And, but at that time I also thought that telepathy might be possible. And so I made the speculation that all these ultra-intelligent machines in telepathic communication would be like the neurons of a vast brain which I called G-O-D-D because it would resemble God so much. Uh -huh. You've never, um, I know you've written hundreds of research papers and reviews, but you've never, have you ever ventured into writing science fiction yourself? Uh, not seriously. I once wrote a, a short story just for typing practice. I never, <laughs> I never submitted it for publication. Uh -huh. Well, uh, what, what do you think motivated you to write uh, papers that range from reviews of philosophers of science like Karl Popper to fractals to um, almost anything I guess one can think of in computer science. What motivates you to? I just have wide interests as, is all I can say really and I have a speculative turn of mind. Mm -hmm. I like, pub I, I have published as I say The Scientist Speculates in which I put forward a number of my own ideas as well as those of, of some quite uh, eminent uh, scientists. And um, I just like speculation. I call them partly baked ideas to generalize the notion of a half baked idea. I had a formula for the length that a, a pea baked idea should be, that it should not exceed. What, what was that? If it, if it was negative, for example, if uh, the formula was such that a negatively baked idea did not deserve even one word. The formula, I think, was um, 10 raised to the power 9, uh, 9 px over 2 was the index, where x was the importance of the idea and p, p measured the bakedness. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you... <laughs> And what were your parameters for X and P? How did well, you they, could only, they couldn't exceed one. 
So uh, a perfectly baked idea that was also of the greatest importance did not deserve more than 30,000 words. <laughs> Uh, and how did you, and the judgment of the bakedness and of the importance was strictly subjective on your part, or did you apply certain tests to it? Um, there were no tests except consistency. If you thought one idea was better than another, then it should have had a, a larger value of P or, or of right. X. And also, was, uh, the formula itself was based on examples. Uh, I can't quite remember. I think that an idea that was only a half-baked idea deserved only, I think, 200 words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that formula was put forth in The Scientist Speculates? Yes, it's in the introduction, I think. Uh -huh. The preface is much shorter. The preface is only one sentence. Uh -huh. The preface was, um, the purpose of this volume is to raise more questions than it answers. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could give us a few examples of those questions. Um, well, they weren't all questions. There was one anonymous idea, which was due to Donald, <laughs> was that half uh, that half baked ideas from people are better than ideas from half baked people. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back to baking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you remember that, Donald? <laughs> yes, I do now. <laughs> I'd like to ask. Uh, coming out again of your World War II experience, whether this experience, which was kept secret, could have had an effect on the development of computers, and if so, why and how? I asked you that, uh, Jack, but I wonder whether Donald has some kind of a response to that. As Jack has mentioned, uh, Max Newman provided a pretty effective transmission belt between the concepts which were normal in the wartime environment and the post-war development of computers in Britain, which has often puzzled outside observers as having got off the ground with a mysterious promptness and speed. Mm -hmm. Americans have sometimes commented on this, but there isn't now any mystery at all, I think, because of this direct uh, transmission. And uh, Max took very active steps immediately to get, uh, I think, about £40,000, which in the money of that day was quite a lot of money, uh, to make a start, to recruit people, uh, including Tom Kilburn, who hadn't been a Bletchley person, but also people like David Rees, Jack Good, Alan Turing, who, who had been a Bletchley. Mm -hmm. So I think that the uh, impact was uh, pretty direct. And how did this compare with the American experience? Because the Americans were using some kind of code-breaking machines as well, I think a simpler kind, perhaps, than the Colossus. Nevertheless, they were in this to a certain extent. And didn't they uh, begin to work with the ENIAC and other machines like this for calculating trajectories and so forth? So why were the British so far ahead in those early years? Well, from the standpoint of uh, history of computing and computers, uh, the ENIAC machine of 1946 at the Moore School at Philadelphia uh, would stand on a par with the Colossus machines of 1944, only two years between them, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously with great relative strengths and weaknesses if you stack them up off against each other, but both were high-speed electronic computers. Uh, the fact that one of them was under secrecy for another few decades means that the history books are only now beginning to be corrected as to which of them was historically the first. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a longer perspective, uh, neither of them could claim in the full sense to be a stored program uh, digital computer uh, in the sense of that's demanded by the theory of the universal Turing machine, capable of being programmed to compute any computable function. Uh, I think most historians uh, would say that in an empirical style, Babbage's creation could be said to fit that logical specification. Mm -hmm. But uh, neither Colossus nor ENIAC uh, meet that spec. But they are, of course, both of them very important stepping stones. 
What, is, what would you call the first true computer then? You just called these two electronic computers, but then you sort of, I, I got the impression you sort of backtracked, and I wonder how you would classify them as true computers, or if not, what would the real first true computer be? Well, they're certainly uh, true computers, but uh, they're not, uh, either of them, universal machines, which is a somewhat technical concept. I would defer to others here, Jan Lee, for example, but the first such machine, in my understanding, uh, in the modern era is the EDVAC, which is an American machine, mm -hmm. which followed on, I think, went operational a year or two later. And certainly by 1950, there were three uh, machines operational in Britain, at least, that m met that super demanding spec, of which the very first would have been probably the Ferranti Mark I, but uh, then Pilot Ace and the uh, EDSAC in Cambridge. And, wh and what, on what do you base that definition? Uh, the quicker, the short answer is whether uh, the machine can be given a program which will cause it to compute any mathematical function whatsoever, um, essentially, period, end mm -hmm. of definition. Uh, whereas the Colossus uh, or the uh, ENIAC could only be set to solve problems which fell into certain defined logical categories. I see. Right. A, a universal machine, uh, as was proved in a purely formal mathematical sense in Turing's 1936 paper, is a machine which, given sufficient time, given sufficient resources, uh, there is nothing, no, uh, no purely symbolically describable task that it cannot mm -hmm. compute an answer to. I see. And where do we go from these machines to artificial intelligence? What's the link there? In uh, technical or human terms? Human because terms. In human terms, the uh, outstanding link was uh, Alan Turing himself. I believe that it was Turing that infected both Jack and me in, uh, during the war. Uh, with something of his own obsessional interest mm -hmm. uh, in the use of these machines, uh, not for the immediate numerical computation or cryptographic computation mm -hmm. that might occur to people, but uh, in simulating and outstripping the capabilities of human thought, reason, knowledge, learning, mm -hmm. uh, all those aptitudes. And during saw that very clearly and communicated um, it extremely clearly in numerous discussions over those years with a, a small interest group that tended to be magnetized around him. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack and myself, I would say, in particular. And where do we, uh, how would you characterize the technical term, the technical aspect of that? Um, that is quite a, a complex question because it hangs on the definition of intelligence. Whether we are speaking of the kind of thought processes which are officially recognized by professional intellectuals as being uh, kosher thinking, mm -hmm. which have in common that they can be formulated in these symbolic styles, if we restrict it to that part of human mental life, then the connection is absolutely direct. Because if you have a form of machine which can compute any specifiable function that can be specified symbolically, and if we confine ourselves to those aspects of thought which can be specified in principle in such a logical language, then it follows that we have the means that in principle can implement all human thought. And I think that's a kind of rough caricature of the reasoning 
that lies below the surface of Alan Turing's 1950 paper, the fairly the rather famous paper in which he propounds the Turing test. What we might get on to later is what one says about the discoveries of more recent time, that the part of human cognition of thought and knowledge which is uh, intellectually respectable in the sense that I've described is only that tiny bit of the iceberg above the surface and that most of the brain's uh, work uh, in solving problems goes on below the level of introspection uh, and could be called not cognition but subcognition. Uh, to which there are two extremely important subdivisions of this submerged continent, one being to do with uh, highly trained uh, skills, whether playing tennis or solving differential equations, doesn't matter, and the other uh, huge submerged continent is to do with forms of uh, visual, uh, creative visual thought, which are very important to mathematicians uh, and creative uh, thinkers generally, uh, spatio-visual intuition, but which in general can only with greatest difficulty, if at all, be translated into ordinary language and symbolic forms. So that there is a big question, which perhaps we won't get into now, uh, about uh, uh, how that uh, side uh, is being, can be tackled by digital computers. Well, is that, I know you don't want to get into it, but I, if I may just ask, uh, would chess playing machines be an example of that in view of the spatial relationships amongst the pieces? There's a very great deal of evidence that it is. The mm -hmm. most massive evidence is uh, uh, a large monograph by Adrian de Grote which was his PhD thesis in 1944, but was subsequently published as a book called Thought and Choice in Chess. And there he studies chess cognition at every level, from Patsas all the way up to uh, grandmasters and former world champions. And certainly he establishes that uh, chess at the top level is a very intricate tapestry which is woven from strands of logical analysis of the kind that uh, Alan Turing was very explicitly aware and other strands uh, which are of these rather more mysterious uh, intuitive and spatial reasoning that you're referring to. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know about the transition that you made after the war from um, your work in biology, and I believe it was genetics, from, yeah. from that work uh, into what we now call AI or artificial intelligence. How did that happen? It happened partly because I'd never forgotten the wartime experience and uh, regarded this as something to be doing until I could get back to what we now called AI and partly because I had an argument with a fellow biologist in a pub about whether it was possible for a machine to learn. And rather than spend words on it, I spent a lot of time at home in the evenings uh, building a machine out of matchboxes and glass beads, which uh, taught itself by trial and error to learn to play the game of tic-tac-toe and eventually learn to play uh, excellent perfect tic-tac-toe. This caught the fancy of a visiting um, professor from Stanford who was uh, doing a stint in Europe on behalf of the Office of Naval Research. And the upshot was I spent a summer in Stanford University in 61 and was so bowled over by the possibilities at last, after all these years, of doing serious experimental work experimental programming and tackling uh, machine learning problems, that when I came back to the United Kingdom, I uh, essentially walked out on the medical faculty 
who employed me with a few helpers and students. Uh, we got uh, some money from the government and found some disused buildings. And uh, we hoist uh, our own experimental programming unit flag and started to do uh, machine intelligence work. It was another two years before we got official recognition from the uh, university, but behind the scenes, the vice chancellor, Sir Edward Appleton, who you may know of because of the Appleton Lair, very great physicist, uh, was really protecting and aiding and abetting us. Uh, mm -hmm. He was very insightful and kind about the future prospects. So that's how our small group got going. In the early 60s? In the early 60s, mm -hmm. yes. Um, was it at that time that you also had developed uh, an interest in chess and uh, uh, speculated on whether or not a machine could beat uh, a human chess player? Well, there are two episodes there. One, during the war, uh, a lot of my discussions with Turing took place once a week when we used to play chess in the pub in Wolverton. And the whole idea of automating game playing as a testing ground for artificial intelligence uh, in this small circle was very central. Incidentally, that was basically how I got to know Turing so well. In that uh, place, either there were chess masters who had been hired for the code breaking work because they were chess masters, that was one of the categories for the recruiters, mm -hmm. or else typically they couldn't play chess at all. Whereas Turing and I were about the only two who came in the in-between category of playing very bad chess. So we <laughs> gave each other an equal game. Mm -hmm. um, but then very much later, uh, after the war, uh, he and uh, David Champanan, Cambridge statistician, developed the first a chess machine, which was really a paper machine, almost like my matchbox uh, contraption. It had to be operated and scored by hand. And Sean Wiley, former Bletchley colleague, and I uh, developed a challenger for it. And the two of us uh, tried to play the two machines off against each other by correspondence chess. And Turing was responsible for calculating and mailing the moves for their side, and I was from our side and both of us were very inefficient and forgetful and somehow the game didn't get on fast and he tried to play the two against each other by programming the Manchester Mark I machine which had then become operational. He had uh, difficulties with Tom Kilburn, the great British uh, pioneer who Max Newman had appointed in Manchester and took to trying to program the machine at night and uh, sleep during the day. Mm -hmm. But one thing and another, it, that project never finished, and a few years later he died, as you know. But you may be thinking about the bet that I and John McCarthy, Seymour Papert, and uh, one other laid in 1970 or 1968, I think it was, in Edinburgh at a party after a machine intelligence workshop against international master David Levy, who wagered that uh, no machine would beat him in the next 10 years. He won his bet, uh, stirred up a great deal of uh, work and um, had a beneficial impact, I think. And 10 years after that, David finally went down uh, against, um, or more than 10 years, against uh, Deep Thought, which is the current world champion uh, chess machine, as you know, right. and which is playing now at a fairly strong grandmaster level. Okay. Um, I guess going back then to the the division or institute you referred to um, earlier, uh, was it there that you began to work in robotics? Yes. Um, we developed into quite a large operation, and by 1973, there were about uh, 70, I suppose, in the whole School of Artificial Intelligence. And uh, I made robotics uh, one of the central projects. 
uh, for very similar reasons to those which led John McCarthy to set up a robotics group at Stanford, um, and Charlie Rosen, Niels Nielsen, and others at SRI International, and Marvin Minsky at MIT. Namely, that the great thing about solving problems in the real world, like how am I going to get that light blue book over here without upsetting the dark uh, green or dark blue book, and in a way it's kind of trivial, but how do I work out that I better steady it with one hand, get this out with the other, then I can put that down gently, put this over here. Now, um, the world is very, the real world is very unforgiving, there's no cheating, and if a strategy which looks superficially correct actually doesn't work because you've taken left out of account that there's a high polish on that surface or something or of that kind, uh, a simulation program is not properly tested. It's part of the nature of intelligence, as most people understand it, to have a grasp of how the world in which you do problem solving actually works. What are the causal structure? How can you exploit that structure to form plans? How by practicing those plans they can become automatic and so forth. Problems which quite small children solve and uh, if you go out into the robotics industry today you'll find if that uh, if tackled in the straight down the middle non-AI style those problems are very unforgiving and very hard. Uh, they can really only be beaten in the long run by genuine intelligence. So it seemed a fair and adverse test. Do you believe or uh, do you think that if a robot can uh, be taught to pick up the books in the proper sequence that you were demonstrating or blocks or anything else and that it can learn that, mm -hmm. that then we can make the leap to say that it thinks? What is the what is the connection in, in artificial intelligence between learning and thinking and yeah. speculating on that? Um, the words of that sort, like think and intelligence, are useful for one particular aspect of, shall I say, smart behavior. After all, a dog can exhibit smart behavior and maybe even solve that same problem effectively. Mm -hmm. What the dog cannot do is to communicate to you uh, in terms that you can understand some retrospective justification or reconstruction of how the dog did it or why the dog did it. And we can. And it's precisely that extra facility uh, to uh, explain ourselves to each other, explain our strategies, that artificial intelligence uh, has as a wild card in the pack. And the reason why I call it a wild card is because although we humans can do that quite well some of the time, an awful lot of our goal-seeking and quite smart activity is a bit of a mystery to us, and if we explain we give a very patchy and inadequate explanation, particularly if you're talking paradoxically to somebody who's operating at a very high level of trained skill and imagination. He may have the greatest difficulty. Now this is where I think it's a mistake to see the goals of artificial intelligence as merely reproducing the properties of human uh, thought. We sh <coughs> and problem solving, we are entitled to aim at something rather better than that, something that I've called superarticulacy. That is to say, how nice to have uh, assistant machines, intelligent assistants, that can make a better job of explaining to us why they're doing what they're doing, what their current goal is, uh, than the human uh, can particularly nice in safety critical areas like what's going on in a power station that's computer controlled or flying an aircraft. Mm -hmm. So you're making a distinction between kinds of intelligence and there could be a machine, a kind of intelligence that is machine intelligence like the name of your book. Isn't that 
right? Yes. Or, and human intelligence, and they may, may not be the same. Uh, they, they may have different characteristics, and uh, some might, different might be more appropriate for others. Different profiles, mm -hmm. although there's a certain common area which the machine intelligence engineers or knowledge engineers absolutely must master. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the, it's pointless to have a machine that is simply solving the problem very cleverly and very fast unless it is doing it in a sufficiently human-like style mm -hmm. to be able to maintain rapport mm -hmm. with the humans that it's assisting and to give human-like intelligible explanations. Mm -hmm. uh, some, there has been some um, feeling in uh, the computer science community and I, I suppose even amongst um, lay people who, are, who, who watch a uh, field of, art, of artificial intelligence that, um, that uh, it was very, they, that the goals of the field were very ambitious and that, they, that there's been some disappointment. Um, do you have any thoughts about, if you, if you feel that, that uh, AI has gone astray in some ways, uh, do, you, do you think you could uh, suggest why it, that might have happened or what direction perhaps uh, the field should go in? Well, I'd like to separate that into the two halves, one being to do with the uh, disappointment mm -hmm. and the other to do with current directions. Mm -hmm. uh, the disappointment is the disappointment felt by onlookers who have goals in their mind which they suppose that the scientists are attempting to achieve. Mm -hmm. If you measure the field off against its own goals, um, I don't think that that uh, sense is valid. Um, the, uh, there's a distinction between the very highly colored uh, images in some of the science press as opposed to the science journals, mm -hmm. um, and the scientists can hardly be blamed if they don't achieve those wonderful things because that wasn't what they were trying to do. Um, on the subject of the field being in danger of losing its way, I think that this is a very real danger. The uh, pioneers of the field developed two massive struts at opposite ends, you might say on two different sides of a river, one being on the symbolic logic side, uh, people like uh, John McCarthy, uh, J. A. Robinson, Niels Nielsen, uh, a tremendous uh, background and basis for mechanizing the purely logical, ultra-rational types of symbolic thought, which ordinarily are only used by humans in discourse among trained uh, intellectuals. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not to say it's unimportant, but that's the part of thought which was focused on. And another stream, of which Newell and Simon would be typical, and to some extent Feigenbaum, who was influenced by them, uh, taking on board what's known about cognitive psychology and how the brain really works. So mm -hmm. there's the sort of symbolic school and the cognitive neural type school. Um, it's clear today that neither of these two struts of the bridge are going to carry any traffic until we have a trained profession uh, corresponding to the bridge itself, the mid-piece, Mm -hmm. uh, that combine the necessary components and types of knowledge, uh, experimental discipline as well as theoretical approach, uh, from the logical side with the cognitive side. And of those, I mean, which uh, do you find that you most naturally ally yourself with? Um, I think it's so essential now to make a an economical blend to create a new scientific technology mm -hmm. that I find the question almost difficult to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been uh, with a number of colleagues, mainly in Europe and not entirely, proceeding in a very low profile way for the last 10 years. We formed a consortium of about uh, half a dozen laboratories. Uh, this is not 
generally known. It's not in the public domain. We circulate our own transactions and we typically meet once a year because it became clear to all of us that by a particular blend of tools and approaches taken from these two different traditions, it was uh, possible in a fairly immediate time scale to demonstrate a new phenomenon of very, very difficult to predict where it will lead, um, namely the automatic synthesis from scratch of brand new human knowledge, human type knowledge I should say. Mm -hmm. By human type knowledge I mean something which the professionals in the given field, which might be in pharmaceuticals or in cardiology or whatever, could read, understand, apply, pass on to their students, but which was entirely synthesized by machine, which sounds a little bit science fiction or might have sounded like that ten years ago. Well, the good news is that it's now fully established. We have three massive uh, worked examples. Uh, we've used outside judges to come in and help us assess before we certificate it any demonstration as being uh, acceptable. And logically, I think um, we pretty well could just as well wind up now because it's been proved. Uh, and some of us are busy now to try and capitalize on this in uh, ways which would be of commercial or other applied benefit. But the key moves which uh, are not uh, to be found in the two original struts of the field, uh, one is the creation uh, using a branch of logic programming of complete logical models or simulations of how the particular domain works. Secondly, the use of such a model to generate exhaustive lookup dictionaries of basic facts of how to do it, like how to uh, interpret electrocardiograms. And the final stage, uh, and this is key, is the use of modern machine learning methods to compress this huge encyclopedia of low-level facts, which are indigestible to the human brain, even though complete and correct, into compact, uh, reasonably user-friendly, uh, uh, what I would call knowledge expressions or rules. And that final product uh, is what I mean by uh, automatic synthesis of knowledge uh, from um, initial logical specifications. Mm -hmm. Now that's been done three times now, once in the chess endgame, once in, elec in uh, electrocardiogram, once in um, troubleshooting electronics on a, a satellite, which was done as a strict commercial job. So I believe that the door's open now. Mm -hmm. And the next step mm -hmm. is how do we train people to be knowledge synthesis specialists. Mm -hmm. But if this is not picked up, uh, then it, uh, the difficulty about artificial intelligence is that it, it hasn't otherwise yet defined itself. Mm -hmm. And people looking at it from the outside with the cool eye of a physicist or a chemist or a traditional computer scientist are justified in saying, who are these people? They talk about knowledge, they haven't got any logical or numerical way of defining and measuring it. Would I listen to a mechanical engineer who couldn't define work or mass or acceleration? But the point about the knowledge synthesis discipline is to make it work, you have to define all these constituent parts. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you regard the expert systems of today that have become the uh, commercial side of mm. AI? Are they a small step along the way to your idea of um, automatic synthesis of knowledge? Um, yes, the, the first step, which was um, rules obtained by dialogue acquisition from mm -hmm. experts, uh, which 
is um, a marginal technology in commercial terms for the reason that I mentioned, that in so many domains the experts are not too articulate as a source of rules. Mm. The next step from that is to don't ask the uh, expert any questions, just observe what he does and get him to give examples of his uh, decisions and machine, use machine learning to convert uh, automatically that material into rules. Mm -hmm. And that is much more cost effective by a factor of more than 10 and is a large part of the revenue that my own institute uh, actually pays its uh, rent with. The third step is where you don't have the expert who can give you rules at all, mm -hmm. which I've just been describing, mm -hmm. which we've been using up uh, 10 years in the margins to try and validate as a possibility. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, yes, it can be done. Mm -hmm. If you don't have an expert, even who can show you how, uh, how he does it, never mind, you can build a logical simulation uh, that will substitute, build up a huge dictionary for each case how to do it for each question, what's the answer, and then out of that extract a logical theory, uh, which I've described as human type knowledge. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely on the road now, and uh, I believe by the turn of the century will be a major industry in its own right. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your, your current institute, that's the Turing Institute. Yes. What is the mandate of the Turing Institute? Uh, the mandate of the Institute is to work in all or any of the fields that Turing himself uh, contributed to, uh, to um, test the theory that uh, the technology is self-viable, that is, that a laboratory that where the scientists own all the, uh, own the uh, laboratory can keep alive from year to year by supplying artificial intelligence services and, uh, and products to industry and government. Mm -hmm. But we mainly sell outside the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. uh, America, Europe and Japan. Mm -hmm. So, but I imagine that some of the work that you outlined will be going on there on automatic synthesis. That's true. In fact, the contract done for the European Space Agency uh, was exactly a case in point, and that is now operational. Um, it is under operational tests. Mm -hmm. Well, we have to wrap up, so I just thought I would ask you for uh, maybe a, a, a statement, a broad statement about what you think the greatest contributions have or have been um, on the part of artificial intelligence to computer science. I think that the biggest one of all is one that is uh, awareness is spreading very rapidly, but it's so recent that it'll be another few years before everybody's heard of it, and it's called inductive logic programming. And um, it would take more time than I suspect we have for me to plunge into it, but inductive logic programming, of whom the number one exponent now is Stephen Muggleton, who very shortly will be moving from Glasgow to join Tony Hoare in Oxford. Mm -hmm. So coming soon, inductive logic programming. I think so, yes. Uh, absolutely central. Thank you for your time.